The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Have you guys ever heard the parable of the uh, rich man and Lazarus? It's the book of Luke 16. I'm going to read that for you guys. Luke 16. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Where have we heard that before? I'm sure I read that before somewhere. Ah, it was Revelation. Listen. And saying, Alas, alas, that great city which was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Ah, that's why I read that before. Isn't that something? I'm going to read something else too in Revelation, just so you get it. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Wait, wait, you have a mystery to solve, right? Many people once thought that the fine linen and gold was exactly what they wore. And so they often equate that to, you know, what a person would wear physically. Did you guys just hear what I just read? What about the armies that are with the Lord? And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Isn't that something? So then fine linen is a garment. Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of the saints is their what? What is the righteousness of the saints? Is it not the acceptance of the sacrifice of Christ? It is nothing else but the full acceptance of the Lamb. Fine linen. Now, wait a minute. Luke 16, 19. Keep all this in your head. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. Purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was led at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus, in his bosom, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gut fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass it to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You guys ever read that before? Give the rich man. Right? There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every single day. He fared sumptuously. Now, fared means, you know, that, that's how he got along, right? Sumptuously every day is how he lived his life. But he was not permitted into the kingdom of God. And he had a warning for those who were left behind. Now, sumptuously, he lived luxuriously. You know how people say, hey, this guy is blessed. He's got big mansion and a big this and a big that and everything is he's got everything what a blessed person that's what we're talking about 
That term, sumptuous, sumptuously, is luxuriously. He had everything. That's what people aspire to have in the world. That's what they believe will complete them. In the world, he lived every single day in luxury, right? So he got along nicely. And also this word fair, right? This word fair means he was a positive person. He was not negative. He was a positive person. It also implies that he was somewhat good. A good person, sound, positive, and luxuries all around. He went to the wrong place. We, re we don't read about this guy doing wrong, do we? It, there was no big statement of how he lived wrongly in his life. No. But we do have this. Luke 16, 25 states. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. He received his good things in this lifetime. Lazarus received evil things. Remember when Jesus said this? He said, don't go into the open squares and pray thinking you're going to be heard from your many words. He said, but when you pray, go into your secret place. He said, don't do your alms in front of everybody. Right? He said, because the reward is going to be for mankind. He said, but do your good deeds in secret that your father may reward you openly. Now, a lot of people can't understand why. Jesus would say such a thing, right? Why would the Lord command us to do our good deeds in secret? Why would he ever do that? When obviously that is not what's being done in the world, right? So what is the problem? You have this, you have this guy who lived a pretty good lifestyle. Why did he go to the wrong place? For what reason? The only explanation that we have is that he received all of what he was going to receive in this lifetime. Now here's what you may not understand and it's part of a denial, right? Somebody's going to be someone, someone is going to feel a bit better after this. See, because there are too many people misplaced. And when you're misplaced, you're chasing an identity. How many people have ever found themselves chasing an identity? See, but when we clarify this, right, Luke chapter 16, when we clarify Luke chapter 16, when we look into Revelation about these similar words, we're going to find something. And as you discover it, you're going to notice something about yourselves. Many people are chasing something. It is, we're raised like this. We are raised to attempt to meet a specific mark in the world, and that's all there is to it. Each and every one of us, each and every one of us has attempted to reach a specific mark in the world. How do you know we're not trying to reach a mark in the world? How do you know that? Is there anybody who ever lived like that? Only one. Only one in the history of history. It's only one ever did that. Everybody else is trying to have an identity. We know that through offenses. We do. We know that through frustrations. See, if a person is not chasing an identity, how then can they ever be frustrated? If they know what their identity is, they're not looking for a new one. If they're not looking for a new identity, they're never trying to conform to anything because they already know who they are, right? The offenses, the irritation, all that comes. When we are attempting to clarify who we are, as we attempt to find out who we are, we do things in life to establish a footprint. Everybody wants to have a good footprint. Nobody wants to be known for a bad footprint. Right? We don't like accusations. We don't like the bad light, the negative light, this, that, and the other. We don't like that. But have you noticed, no matter how much you run from it, why does it keep coming back to you? Come on, somebody. Throughout your whole life, you can run. You're trying to make it so that nobody can say anything wrong, bad, or anything about you. But the shortcomings come out of nowhere and bang, don't they? Don't they? They upend. They upend our attempt at being model. I know a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people talk. Many people want to be blameless among men. In other words, have no flaws. They want a record where no one can ever say anything negative about them. That's what they want. Let me share this with you. Because I strongly believe in this. 
I personally would never, ever follow a person who knows nothing about wrongdoing. I would never follow a person who knows nothing about falling. I would never follow a person who has not felt the stain of having their life upended. Do you know why? Because when you follow someone, especially in my case, if I follow someone, I can't commit myself to a person who, is in, who could be incredibly weak. If they've never been tried like that, their life been turned upside down. They don't know what's on the opposite side of the fence. They don't know what the mindset of desperation is. They don't know these things. And if they don't know these things, when put into a compromising position, they're going to fail. Do you know that everybody, if they're put in a position of desperation, they're going to act desperately, except that person had gone through that before. Only those who have gone through something before will not act on those same things continually. Do you know that? If a person has never been hit or scratched or cut, they don't know what pain is. Suppose a person did not know what pain was, but they're strong and healthy. Would you follow a person like that? I would not. Do you know why? Suppose we had to go on a march, and it was life or death to finish the march. Now, this person is strong and healthy. This person is incredibly strong. But they've never had a broken bone, no scratches, no anything. I'm not following that person. Why? Because I know as soon as that person gets cut, and the cut, it'll be a tiny cut, that cut has a little bit of infection. That person's going to react to that pain for the first time. And they're going to react like we did. You know, when you got your first fever, you can remember and you thought your life was, you know, it was just the most terrible thing in the world. Now, if you get a fever now, you just keep going about your day. Somebody will say, hey, you feeling all right? Yeah, I got a little fever, but let's get this done. But in the beginning, when you had your fever, do you have a, what's wrong with you? Oh, I got a fever. I think it's the end of the world. Right? If you go through nothing, you don't know what to expect and you'll fall down. You're going to fall down. If you've never felt pain, you're going to react. Those who have felt pain, they already know what it feels like. They can continue. They already know how to handle it. They can continue. If you've never had your life upended, you don't know how to get back up and walk again. Many of you have had your life upended multiple times. Many of you have fallen multiple times. Many of you have been through trial after trial after tribulation after tribulation. And you ask yourself, Plenty of times. Why do I keep going through this stuff? You see, you don't. You may not know you're strong right now. So that when that situation comes, guess what? The wind that can stop the strong man because he never felt wind before will not phase you. Huh? If nobody knows about hail and they're caught in the middle of a storm, they're going to have a bad day. If you've been caught in the middle of a storm and hail smacked you in the head, as soon as you see the clouds form, you're going to say, well, let me stop going this way and find shelter. Nobody knows why. They're, they're going to say, why are you finding shelter? For what reason? It's not doing anything right now. Bang. All of them get knocked out except you. When you've gone through things before, you have wisdom. When you're shocked by a situation, you're not sober. You're desperate. When you've gone through something over and over again, you're not desperate. You're sober. You already know the hurt is coming. And because you know it's coming, you'll say, well, let's just keep going. It's just pain. Right? It's only for a little while. Kind of like what the elders used to tell us. Oh, don't worry about it so much. It'll pass. You remember when somebody would say, it'll pass. You'll be all right soon. And you're looking at them like, how can you say this? How can you say I'm going to be all right? Remember that first breakup? You're going to be all right. You didn't want to hear that. You wanted someone to fix it. You didn't want to hear you're going to be all right. Right? Remember when that trouble came into your life? You did not want to hear anybody's advice the first time you got in real trouble. You didn't want the advice. You wanted the fix. You prayed to the Lord to fix it. Not to show you the importance of why that, that this problem came into your life. That wasn't your prayer. You said, Lord, deliver me. When something happens, people say, Lord, deliver me. Isn't that what we say? Something happens, you say, Lord, deliver me. As you mature and something happens, and you've grown in wisdom, then you know nothing can happen in your life 
without the oversight of Jesus Christ. See, that's when you realize, wait a minute, my life is highly managed. What am I doing? As you gain wisdom, you know what turns, what, how darkness hides. For example, darkness can hide in a small pain pill. You may be in a car accident for the first time you hurt yourself. You get prescribed pain medication. You stay on it too long, you find out you're addicted. You can't do anything without it. Now, if you get off that and you get another car accident, you're going to say, hold up. I don't want that. I'm going to the store. I'll get something over the counter. But not that. Hmm? That's what you'll say. Not that. Because you're not going to go through that again. Because you understand the dangers of something so insignificant. That's wisdom. Now, a person who has never gone through anything before, they have no wisdom. You know what the Bible says about your sufferings? Anybody? The Bible tells you why you suffer. It's just that no one ever reads it like that. It tells us why we suffer. It tells us why we have trials and tribulations. It spelled it out. If you don't know it, if you can't see it, if it never entered into your mind, you'll have your own explanation go through them anyway. Eventually, if you're marked by the Lord, you'll learn it anyway. Some do that, kicking and screaming, but they eventually learn. But it's a hard road. They come into your life for a reason. Many people don't know who they are yet. But it's okay. You'll get there. You know, life circumstances, things you go through. As I said before, some of us are stubborn. Some of us have to be broken with a crowbar. And others, a simple tap on the hands will do. Me, I'm a crowbar. I don't know about you. You may take a little tap on the hands, you're good to go. No, I need the crowbar. I need the full treatment. I need the big paddle, right? I need the big one. But there's one thing for sure. I've never been spanked twice for the same thing. How about that? That's not going to happen. No. But I still need the crowbar. I do. I'm very thankful for all of it. Because I would have no wisdom for you guys, nor anybody else. Let's continue to read real quick, because I hope you, hopefully you guys will see something out of this. So this guy is stressed in purple. It specifically says purple and fine linen. And we just read that fine linen is associated with righteousness. In other words, it is a garment. Fine linen is a type of garment that you wear refined. It's a refined garment. So it's one of those words. It may not mean an absolute physical thing, but it is associated with something being refined or have an appearance of being refined. Fine linen. Purple is the giveaway. Purple is synonymous with a royal mindset. How do I know this? By reading in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Because with that word purple, you see that the Lord used that word in a disciplinary way towards Israel. In other words, they were, they were decked that way. Israel was. Precious stones, a comely daughter, right? All that good stuff. But her way was aired. So she looked the part, but inwardly she was empty. This was Israel back in the day. And why did that happen? Because she was delivered, yes, but she became corrupted. So she still had the appearance of deliverance, but inside there was corruption. Inside there was corruption. This person didn't do anything wrong. They just lived good. But here's the thing. They had the reward right now. They lived their lives. They, he lived his life sumptuously. Now, before you go off kilter, let me tell you what that means. I've seen people who lived this way who never had a hard day in their life. That's a fact. The hardest day they ever had was when they didn't have enough choices of what they were going to eat for lunch. That's the hardest day they had. There are some people like that in the world. Now, you may not be familiar with that. You may not. And thank God for it. I can never say I've lived sumptuously. Right? I know some rich people who cannot say that. That's fact. It doesn't mean you're rich. No. It just means somehow, somehow you've been rewarded. All this good is coming to you. You're enjoying your paradise here. Right? You know how when you look at a person, you say, wow, that person has everything. I'm going to be just like that person. Forget that thought. Your heart's in the wrong place. Here it is. Because this exposes the heart of a person. Whatever you love, you're going to run after. You will. Right? Anybody who ends up living this way and continues living that way, it really conveys condition of the heart. People who live this way, right, who have no troubles whatsoever, 
You don't want to know what they do to keep what they have. You don't want to know that. I'll tell you right now, to have riches, you're going to have to do something crooked because these are Satan's kingdoms. And when I say crooked, I mean you're going to have to do something that your Lord and Savior would not look goodly upon. This person had the dress. He looked the part. But his reward was here. He lived good here. Listen to what it says. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. He was full of sores. In other words, he was suffering. I'm going to show you something about the heart. He was suffering. And desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And the dogs, of course, would come and lick his wounds. Now, obviously, the rich man knew about him at the gates. Why was he still covered with sores? How could anybody live sumptuously? Know about the distress of someone that pops up every single day and they still live sumptuously. How could that happen? That shows a condition of the heart. So when you have everything here on this earth, when your paradise is here, you have to agree to overlook the needs outside of yourself. Because if a rich person ever looked at the needs outside of themselves, they wouldn't maintain their richness. Surely if they had a heart, they could not maintain it. They couldn't. It's, it's kind of like when you're young and you're chasing these movie stars who live rich and all this, that, and the other, right? People want to emulate them and be like them. And they have set the social standard for everybody else they used to. Not anymore, they used to. But these people have lots of money and they try to appease their own conscience by giving to a, some charity that advertises on television so they can be shown in a better light. They get, they get trapped, snared in this money thing, right? They do, because believe it or not, they're not rotten people going in. They're just bombarded with things all the time. And they end up compromising after compromise after compromise. And they're so guilty sometimes that they will join satanic things simply to lift the guilt. Many people don't know that. You do now. In other words, they're stuck. Some of them cry like you wouldn't believe because they believe there's no escape. They know what they have done. To not know what you have done is to push the word of God away. Period. There's not a soul on this earth I can say they don't know about the word of God because that's not what the father says and I've never met a person who didn't know about the word of God I've met some people recently who have no connection to Jesus they don't know what that word is but they still know about the word of God they don't want to look into it so now somebody says Michael do you think the, the talk of God and of Christ is a, is a fake for those in us no no, it's not fake, but hear me on this. People in the spotlight, right? In order to keep their riches, they have to make a choice. If you're ready to give up your riches, then have a conscience. If you're not ready to give up your riches, they're going to have to do exactly what those who keep giving them money, they're going to have to do with a... Because listen, there, there's a guild that can make a person famous or not. You look at any star... And they've all gone through the same cycle. Here it is. They get, they make a few, they make some music. Or they make a movie or two. And then all of a sudden they hit this plateau in their career. They can't go any higher. Right? And that's what normally when they stop making music and stop doing this and the other. All of a sudden, out of the blue, right after you haven't heard from them in a while. You see them all over television. Everywhere. On TV. Everywhere. On the advertisements. And then you hear about them, this is very specific, you hear about them making 10 of something. Always 10. Now if they go out there and do that and all of a sudden they're on tour, all of a sudden they're making money here and there. But the content that they're in has these demonic overtones. You know exactly what they have done. You know exactly what they have done. You, even the government bows to this to certain guilds. Do you know that? The government does. I know, many of you don't know that, do you? And essentially, the government will appease a specific guild. Do you know why? Because if they don't, they're ruined. They know what will happen if they don't. The resources are not so structured as you would believe. The resources are managed by the same folks 
are directly connected to the entertainment industry. Why in the world would an entertainment industry be the richest industry on the earth? It makes oil um, between between entertainment and oil. Which one do you think brings in the most money? It's not oil. It's not. It's entertainment. Don't you know that? So then the people who represent the entertainment industry, these are the puppets that continue to keep people involved. Why is it important for them to put evil things in entertainment, nudity in entertainment, certain social things in entertainment, all this stuff in entertainment? I'll tell you why. It is the law when you come into this world that you be exposed to entertainment. And once you're exposed to entertainment, the education begins. Your education begins. No one is here on this earth without being indoctrinated. To have a good job, you have to be indoctrinated. To have a good career, you have to be indoctrinated. And if you ever turn your back on that, trust me, every avenue you thought that you could cover, they already know about it. They know all about you. They can stop anybody they want. They don't even have to try. They just simply do it. Remember the military industrial complex? You guys remember that? Remember the Kennedys? Jackie Gleason? You remember that guy? Why is it that the Kennedys knew all these stars, like Marilyn Monroe, you know, all these people, but these stars were always in the White House. And every time they went to the White House, policy would change. Why? Why, why, why? Messengers. Always making deals with the messengers. Back in the day before President Trump, the news, the news would govern the outcome of many things. And before that, it was honest, but that was when it was, you know, in the newspaper form. When big media hit and entertainment came out and it took over everything, right? It really could cause the people to navigate in certain directions. The only way a person received the truth was from these news corporations. Don't you know that? It's the only way they could receive the truth. When the internet came out, all that dried up. Now the truth can be what anybody wants it to be, but we're in the end. I'm going to say that one more time. Back in the day, to get the truth, you needed to have the news. The news came by form of a newspaper at first. Right Before that, it was bulletins and other things, but it came from these certain locations that were trusted institutions. That was the beginning of the build-up. Then entertainment TV came out, radio came out. And so your news was on the, anything said on the radio, anything said on the television was believed, and people would act upon that immediately. That's the way it was. I know young people today, they know nothing about that, right? So some of the highest paying jobs, and, and to be that responsible person was to be that news anchor. You were the trusted person for all of America. That's what you were. But you would speak something to the people and they had no choice to believe it. Whatever you presented was truth. Then it continued, but entertainment grew. All this was on purpose. See, with the news, you people needed the truth. They were disconnected from seeing things. They didn't have the internet. They couldn't access anything, right? So then the news was your best source to find out what was going on around the world, right? So they would get their little news and this, that, and the other. That thought about television. When television came out, so did entertainment. Big producers came out, this, that, and the other. They sent all that up to entertain people, just like Rome in the old days. Gladiators and all that stuff. So when the television came out and entertainment came out, the indoctrination process was at its peak. So the movies that would come out would always have a message. And you would always live your life according to entertainment. So in on TV, if somebody wore something or somebody did something in the house, so would everybody else in the country. If they if they if they gave their stamp of approval on a situation on television, then it was approved by Americans also. Young kids would watch television and listen to radio. They grew up with it, so it became part of their environment. When they grew up, of course, they're going to get a TV to continue to be programmed because they like certain things. Once you are exposed to something on a daily basis, it becomes part of your reality, your home, right? Especially when you're young. Listen to me. If anything is around your children... It is part of their home. And what that means is when they get older, whatever was around them, they're going to bring back into their lives to establish their home. Do you hear me? 
most of you, some of you had arguments and that became part of your home. Do you know what happens when there's silence around you? You may start an argument and not know why. Now that sounds radical, but not to those who actually live this on a daily basis. Whatever you have around a child becomes part of their home. When they grow up and get out on their own, they're going to recreate home. Do you hear me? So all of what their environment was, they're going to bring it back. Then they're going to give it to their kids. See how that works? And now through this transition, the news told the truth. But then entertainment did something very unexpected. It appealed to many. It appealed to the young and to the old. And these movies that were coming out were designed specifically for that. In the making of these movies, especially Hollywood... Maybe you don't know about Hollywood. Do you know that Hollywood had a masterful science guild behind it? Do you know that? Consultants from every discipline worked in Hollywood. Hollywood became a country hall on its own. Hollywood was powerful because it would navigate the populace. And they already proved their point with a few people that were in power. How they could turn the whole world against anybody in one night. How they could run a campaign and bombard people with a message on a continuous basis until the person could no longer see the message, yet their activities would be conducive of that message, message making it normal to them. This is what they did. Now we get to this point, right? People have been entertained so much that they believe entertainment is real. They, uh, listen, they took the news and they overwhelmed the news purposely with entertainment. Even the news, listen, the news went 24 hours. But what did the news channels do? They put entertainment in between their stories, didn't they? They made it entertaining. Didn't you notice that everything turned into entertainment? Everything turned into entertainment. And when it turned into entertainment, that's when the true darkness came through. Because of its normal throughout all those media sources. It's going to be normal to your kids, even to you. Now, when you're listening to something, many people cannot notice when a person curses on the Internet anymore. Do you know that? Many people cannot tell or they can't remember the last time they saw nudity. They can't. Why? Because it's been an acceptable part of people's environment. Can you say de-evolving? We're not evolving. We're devolving. We're becoming archaic. Now, when all this entertainment and everything flipped everything upside down, it was purposed. It was purposed because in order, in order to attack somebody's faith, Satan knows that your faith is supernatural. In order to attack that, in order to weaken that, you must alter what a person believes is real or not. How do you do that? You ready? You start taking unreal scenarios and you cause them to become a, to be a reality. I'm going to say that one more time. You take these unreal scenarios people have seen in movies, people have seen in these entertainment skits and everything else, and you make that a reality in this present day. Say, for example, now, don't think, uh, listen, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I'm showing you something. Say, for example, you guys knew me very well from a cartoon strip in a newspaper. You said, oh, that's Mike from around the world, and that cartoon strip, you laugh, you know, and all this, and the other. Ten years later, Mike from around the world runs for Senate. And now I'm in the Senate. Mike from around the world is in the Senate. Now, at first, it's going to be laughable. Because you say, huh, that's, my, that's the real Mike from around the world. Now he's in the Senate. Are you kidding me? The world is over. But I stay there. I stay there. And then it becomes normal. Now, that just, you may not know this, but that blurs the line between entertainment, listen, entertainment, and what's real. When it happens too many times... People then start adjusting reality themselves. And what they'll begin to do is say, ah, you know what? Entertainment is not entertainment. Entertainment's real. You guys follow me? They'll say entertainment is real. It's got to be real. There's real stuff in entertainment. Then people stop looking at entertainment as though it's entertainment. Now they're on a quest. And the populace begins to branch out in many different realities. Now you've really got them. Because when you can make entertainment real, when you can cause the fantasy to become real, then you can place somebody's faith under subjection. Because now that, you know, if entertainment is real, then what I must have had may not be real. Now you put it into question 
by virtue of what a person accepts as reality. Are you guys following me? Right now, there are people out there right now. Their faith is under a big question mark in their lives. Because what they thought was entertainment somehow became real. And because it became real, the foundations of that person had to be questioned. And now their faith may not be real. And then in that case, you break down the barriers of all faiths. So everybody can hear everybody else's story. You know what the next step is? Anybody know what the next step is? Because right now they have broken down the barriers. Right now they have caused entertainment to become real. Right now they have caused many to question their core and fundamental beliefs. You know in the Bible when it says, a day will come when men no longer endure sound doctrine, that day has already been here. That's what I'm telling you about. Do you know what the next step is? Once you cause a person to question their faith, do you know what the next step is? Now it only works with the public. It can't work with the appointed individuals over the new reality. It has to work with the public. Do you know what the next step is? Something I talk about a lot. And you just step right into it. You ready? Demonstration. Now they got to take this fractured reality and make it real. See, because at this point, everybody is looking for what's real and what's not. Many people have accepted and cross-examined and accepted new things. So now they're looking for something heavier to lock in what they are to believe. Because in truth, they don't know what to believe. Come on, somebody. Right now, they don't know what to believe. They don't know what to believe. And when you're in a society where people don't know what to believe, then guess what? They expose themselves to everything because they don't know what to believe. When the moment of demonstration comes, whatever can manifest among the people, that's what the people accept. And that's what people will force others to accept. And then everything happens in reverse. Did you know that? That's what's happening. That's what you're under. That's what you're going through right now. Now listen, careful point. It can never be from the leaders. It has to be from the people. If it's from the leaders, it's going to remain in this structured realm of chaos. If it's from the people, nobody has a choice. They already know this. Did you know that nothing ever comes from the people? We can only do it one time. It has to work the one time. So when it comes from the people, no one disputes it. Why? There's no historical precedent of it happening. So something will have to shatter, shake the people so much that they demand from each other an acceptance. See, that's the only way to calm down. Once the people have demonstration, they're going to look at their friends and say, you tell me you saw that. Yes. Do you believe you? Yes. And then they'll go to others and do the same thing. It'll become a new foundation from the people. And it's, it's, it's just like, you know, line by line. This little pre-planned thing everybody's living through. Satan is quite methodical. He's been around since the beginning. He's had a long time to refine his plan. And the Lord lets him fly. Because if your faith stays intact, you can never be blinded. If your faith stays intact, you can never be altered. You can never be changed. If your faith stays intact. Your faith staying intact is your father's responsibility he gave to Christ. And that's based upon your acceptance of the sacrifice. It must be. Your acceptance of the sacrifice is not something anybody can convince you of. You either identify with it or not. Let me tell you something else that's been happening. For a long time, people think they had to go out and make people believe about Christ. Do you guys know what witnessing actually is? It is witnessing. What does that mean? Well, first of all, you cannot witness to somebody who is not, right? You can't witness to anybody who has no idea of what you're talking about. That'd be like me coming, just coming on COT to you guys who have never been part of the situation. I said, listen, I'm going to witness to you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to witness to you guys something. Well, what is it? I'm going to witness to you guys about what just happened about six hours ago. You could say, what in the world is he talking about? Then I go into this long story and tell you some wild things. And you would leave not changed. I didn't witness to you. It had no effect. When you witness to someone, there is an effect. But the person must be able to identify what you're witnessing. In other words, you're telling them something. When you tell it, it brings it out of them. It must be in them first. That's what witnessing is. When you have a witness to something, you have somebody else who saw the same thing you did. When you witness to someone, 
Both of you have the information, but one will speak it, the other will confirm it. That's witnessing. You cannot witness to someone who does not know your language. If you go to someone with a gospel and they have no nothing of Christ in them, you're speaking a foreign language. You know what you've been doing. If you've been out there spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, what you have been doing is sounding a trumpet. A trumpet sounds to those who know, who understand what the trumpet is for. They understand what it's for. If, if a trumpet sounded in the middle of a zoo and there were only animals, then so what? When a trumpet sounds and you have one or two people who they know what that trumpet is for, then you have blown the trumpet. You cannot blow the trumpet to someone who has, who has no idea, no connection to what that trumpet is. You must blow it to those who are witness of that sound. They sound right now at 21 kilohertz. It's very loud. It's at 42 decibels. Do you guys hear it? It's coming through the microphone right now. It is. It really is. Do you hear it? Can you hear it? Okay, let me stop. How can you guys didn't hear it? Why did nobody hear that sound? It was, it was louder than I was. Well, I turned it back just a little, but you didn't hear it. Huh? It's because it was at 21 kilohertz. That's why. Sorry about that. You can't hear 21 kilohertz. There's an effect. Voltage went through the wires. It took up bandwidth transmitting. All that good stuff, but you didn't hear anything. Somebody said it wrong frequency. There you go. There you go. Wrong frequency. So you can stand right beside it and you wouldn't hear it. In fact, I told you guys before, they have an app on a phone. Right? And it's for teenagers. They can actually send out messages that talk and nobody can hear it but them. Because as you get older, you lose the ability to pick up any sound at specific frequencies. So guess what? You can be standing right beside someone. And if you have no ability to perceive it, it is nothing to you. When you go out with the gospel to those of whom God has not truly created, and they're of another source, they cannot hear you. What do you think the Lord said? Those who have ears, let them hear. So what about those who don't have ears? You're not speaking to them. I remember when one time Angela said, you got to tell them so-and-so again. I said, I already told them. She said, I know, but some people don't hear. I said, ah, I'm not speaking to those who don't hear. I'm speaking to those who will hear. Witnessing. It's what you're doing. You're not witnessing the people who have no ability to hear you. You're witnessing people who are looking for the exact thing you carry. In other words, you've been yelling out for your family that's already in this world, coming to age at different ages, and they've been answering. They're your family. See, the Lord said this. Here's what just kind of ruins the whole thing, right? The Lord said to certain people, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Now, Jesus does not lie. If he never knew them, then he never knew them. Think about that. If he never knew them, he never knew them. Do you hear me? See, that's why when you're talking to people with the gospel, be careful. Make sure the Lord is doing his work and you're not doing the Lord's work. Because the Lord knows exactly who the people are. That's why I say go out to everybody, go out to every corner, go everywhere. You don't know who's going to respond. But we still go out with a message. Because isn't it a blessing, that person who finally reached you? Isn't that a blessing? That one person who reached you, had they not come? Because see, you heard about the gospel before, but somehow they spoke it at the right time. The time where you were ready to receive. And has anybody ever gone through a time where you wanted to hear about it, but nobody was around? I can't be the only one. There was a time I wanted to hear about the word and nobody was around. Do you know that? Now, now, I know, I know, I'm talking for COT, and you're not supposed to say things like that, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to represent, you know, this perfection. All the, no, no, no. You got me wrong, buddy. There was a time I wanted to hear. There was no one. See, there was a special person. They carried the word at the right time for you. And you heard. After all the people. You already knew about Christ. You knew about Christ. You knew about the biblical figures. You had been touched from time, you know, time to time. But it was that one person who spoke about it. And it was at that moment you heard. See that? So listen, what that means is, what that means is, when a person can hear at that special moment like we all did, 
anyway, because that one person got through to us and nobody else did. You have to be willing to go forward and let the Lord do His work. People don't accept Christ based on our timeline. They can hear about Christ a million times. The Lord knows when He will prepare the ears of the one hearing Him. If we are diligent and faithful, we'll have that message on a continuous basis. And when a person comes of age, when the Lord deems them ready, they'll respond. How beautiful a message. You guys do get that, right? So we don't, you see, people used to, they used to write me and say, Mike, I went to my so-and-so and, -so and they, get, they won't accept the word, they got angry. That's God's work to prepare them. I have never gone to anybody who flat out rejected the word of God, never. Do you know why? Because I wait for God's appointment. I know the Lord will prepare a vessel to receive his word at a specific time. He'll do it every single time. What we must do is be diligent and not play God. Not crucify someone because they don't want to hear it from us. But to be willing to carry that message anywhere and everywhere all the time. Anywhere and everywhere all the time. See, if the Father knows who can hear and I don't, I'm taking it everywhere. And if somebody says, I don't want to, we don't want to hear your garbage, then so be it. I'm going to shake the dust off my feet and go somewhere else and do the same thing. You don't force it down somebody's throat. It's an invitation. Do you guys see that? So when you're speaking to people, you're shining a light. Not everybody is going to respond to your light. And I'm telling you, there's somebody out there that needs that light. You will never dictate who needs it. God does. He knows the truth of it. We must be willing to shine that light. Can you imagine what would have happened if that person who finally got through to you never showed up? Can you imagine? Now, your father was not going to permit that. But can you imagine? Well, let's put it this way. Can you imagine what would not have happened if they didn't show up? Some people were not so persistent by way of love itself. You guys get it? So it was never about control. It was about this resounding trumpet blowing. And everyone who could hear that specific trumpet would respond when God prepared them to respond. Many things a person will go through before they actually respond. They can hear you, but they may not respond. They can comprehend it, but they may not respond. When the Lord has conditioned them to respond, they will. Like when we lost everything. We said, oh Lord, I'm done playing the games. And that was some people said. <laughs> when, when everything blew up there, I'm done playing games. We relented, but only after it blows up. But we still relent, right? Can't you see the path of the Lord everywhere? How intimate, meticulous the path and plan is. How it's so narrow. Not many people can find it. Most things are on it. But it is an indeed a narrow path. It is not a broad path. It's not the path everybody takes. No. It's narrow. But there it is. Now you living, listen, back to what I was saying though, you living in this world at this stage, the stage of demonstration. If you guys are here in this day, you're here by the Father's hand. Please hear me on this before we go forward. If you're here this day and you believe in Christ, you're here by your father's hand there's no other reason that you're here but by the father's hand and let me tell you what that means every plan of the enemy to subvert you failed see satan wants you not to believe in christ he failed he threw everything at you and he failed he tried every sneaky tactic and he failed and if you're young and you believe in Christ the enemy is going to fail in your life the belief you have in Christ is not a joke it is imprinted upon you upon your soul and it's that belief that's the biggest shield anybody could ever have your father has nurtured that faith and Satan has failed miserably. He tried everything and he failed. See, many of us have scars and wounds and other things, right? From many happenings in this world. People have become alcoholics. They were addicted to 
contains. Well, let me give you a message, too. You're not condemned because you believe. Satan hates that. Oh, he hates it. He hates it. And I'll say it again. If you believe in Christ, you are not condemned. See, because, hear me on this. Nobody started out or made it through this process squeaky clean. No one did. Can you hear me? No one did. At different stages, we were delivered of different things, and we will still yet be delivered. So don't let anybody condemn you. Well, you know, you're still doing so-and-so. You're not going... Uh -uh -uh. Uh -uh. It is by faith, not by works. Now, that statement where it says, faith without works is dead. You're pursuing him, aren't you? You're pursuing Christ. What do you think that is? You refuse not to believe in him, and you continue to pursue him. And there are things you're doing in your life, you keep doing it. You keep doing it. No, who came to Christ clean as a whistle? No one. Oh, well, let me, let me put it this way. Jesus came to set the captive free. Thank you, Lord. Jesus came to give sight to the blind. He came for me. I was blind. I was captive. I was lame where I couldn't walk. That was me. Thank you, Lord. And he will still yet deliver me. Thank you, Lord. Flaws and all. Thank you, Lord. This isn't about being perfect in the eyes of somebody else. No. No. This is about your core belief in Christ. See, he will finish the work he began in you. And what work is that? Full deliverance is what that work is. Full deliverance is without, he's not done with you yet. That's why you're still here. That's why you still believe. Isn't that beautiful? You're still here, which means the process is continuing. And you still believe, which means you are of the family of the living God, period. It is impossible for someone to believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross, was raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and be lost. No, the acceptance of that sacrifice of Christ upon your life, when you believe that, oh, you will change. You're pursuing him. You're still reading. You're pursuing him. There is no condemnation against you. You're in your father's process. You're becoming real eternal beings. Real children of the Lord. This isn't a show. This is for real. And it's also absolute. It's absolute. If the Father deemed this upon you, it doesn't matter if anybody claims it or not, it's yours anyway. That victory is yours. You're seeing the process. By the time it's all over, all of us will understand the process of our Father will have nothing but thanks. Oh, and by the way, no one has imagined what the end will actually be like, what the eternal realm will actually be like, because we don't have the body capable of encasing it, of comprehending it. We don't. We can come up with the, the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. We'll never measure up to what it actually is. How about that? You belong to your Father. You come from many walks of life. And Satan has failed the whole way. Now remember that. Because once we start reading about Babylon, you already know about this parable. I'm going to finish this one part in here, but you know about this parable. We're going to start reading about Babylon. And some of the consequences of Babylon can become quite spooky. So remember your faith. You believe because God put that belief in you. You didn't just conjure up that belief. You certainly don't believe by all the evidence. God put that belief in you. That's called faith. See, when you have no evidence to believe anything by, you can only believe it by faith. And when you can remember back as far as you can and you've always known that Jesus was real and God was real, no one has ever given that to you but your Father in heaven. And the reason why you have that faith is so that Christ will never lose you. He gives us each other. What I'm doing, what the, all this talking that I'm doing, you know, they're sharing the word with you. That is nothing more been part of my life to share the word of God with others and to assist in any way I can because God put faith in me. You do the same for somebody else. And it's never for God. Never. It's not a competition. It's not what this is. It's not. That means you guys are much more valuable than I am. If the Lord put this passion in me, 
for servitude to you. Period. That's why he gave me the heart he gave me. For the causes that are of him that I do. I'm telling you guys, if you, if you want your kids to have the best education, right? You send them to the best schools. Correct? And evidently, he wants you to have the, 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 the very specific education. If you've come here, because I don't exactly line up with everybody else. You have that victory. All right, let's continue. Listen. Back to this parable in Luke 16. So, Abraham says in Luke 16, 25, right? Because a guy cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame, right? I'm tormented in this flame. Listen to this. Why is he, tor why is this guy who was in fine linen, right? He fared sumptuously every single day. Why is he in torment? Why is he in torment? Abraham said this, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. That was in your lifetime. While you were living, you received your good things. He says, he says and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted. And you're tormented. So Lazarus received the evil things. Listen, Lazarus is with the Lord. Now hear me on this. But Lazarus is, was full of sores on the earth. Lazarus was poor. Lazarus was a beggar at the gates. So he was known for, he was known to be disgusting, diseased. You know, if a person like that showed up, somebody would say, ah, oh, you must be doing something wrong. You must have some hidden darkness nobody knows about. You wouldn't be in that condition. Isn't that how people do? Well, you didn't get over your addiction, so you said something's wrong with you. Because they really do think that you have to reach this point of perfection for salvation or something like that. Let me tell you something about this sick person, this poor, sick, diseased person at the gates. You know what that person knows? The rich person, he knows a good time, doesn't he? The rich person knows what it is to fulfill himself and it'd be full, this poor person, because of the hunger and the misery, this poor person knows what's fake and what's not. This poor person knows what it is to turn away from someone. This poor person, this sick person, Lazarus, he knows what it is to be for forgotten about. He knows what that is. He's been in that condition. He knows what it is for people to walk away from him. He knows what it is. The cruelty of people to fill themselves up and only leave crumbs for everybody else. Oh, he saw the true state of all things. This rich person is blind as a bat. He can't even see what he has become. See, when you're in distress, when you've been in these predicaments, when you've been backstabbed, when people have forgotten about you, when people walked away from you, when they said that you were the worst thing in the world, you know what pain feels like. You know what it is to be forgotten. You know what it is to be stepped on. You know what it is to be shunned in public. And because of that, guess what you become? You become a saint. How so, you say? Because if you see someone on the ground and they're sick, your passion level is going to go right off the meter. And you will never turn your back on somebody like that in distress. You will show them pure love. Do you hear me? So through his distress... He learned something nobody else can learn. You know, in my personal life, we're really sensitive to those that society has thrown away. I'm very sensitive to the heartbroken, to people who have, to people who have just turned their backs on them. I know certain conditions. I know what it is to be forgotten. You know what it makes me do? When a person with a tiny voice says help and nobody else hears it, I lock in on it. And I won't walk away. But nobody else can see the importance of just lending out your hand. Because to them it's no big deal. But that person who needs that hand, you have to be in need to know what the value of something is. You have to be in need to know what the value of a helping hand is. Now those who don't need a helping hand, they don't know what the value is. Those who do, well they do. Should they ever get well? They're always going to reach out their hand to somebody else. Lots of people, do, they don't like to take risks. They say, well, what if I go to somebody and they just, you know, they just backstab me? Well, let me, let me share this with you. If you've been backstabbed multiple times, to the point where you realize, wait a minute, sometimes people are so misguided. And I 
that's what they do. And it hurts when you've been backstabbed to the point where something is ruining your life. It has ruined a part of your future. But then you realize that that person has no idea of the damage they have caused. After you've gone through that enough and you get over yourself, you can even reach out to those who backstab others because you know what's coming for them. Likewise, you're not going to backstab somebody else. But you won't shun people either. Because you'll understand that under the influences of darkness, a person is capable of doing anything evil. And you'll look at the person and say, that person just doesn't get it. Because see, once you've been backstabbed enough and you see the post-reactions of a person who's, who actually did that, they don't know the depth of the repercussions. They don't know that. And if they don't know, they have no idea what they truly did. That means they have to be broken from the darkness that's blinding them to the damage you're doing. But who's going to be willing to endure backstabbing to help somebody who backstabs? It'll be me. You may not know this, but Satan has a hold of quite a few people. And I do not agree with Satan. That's why I don't condemn. You know how people say, well, that person just, you know, no good. Forget about that person. I'll never do that. You know why? Because I will not agree with the adversary. When the adversary has somebody in their clutches. And they are rotten and terrible people. I am not the one who says that person is terrible and rotten. Shun them from everything. I'm, no, I'm not that individual. I'm the individual that says, uh, no, I do not agree with Satan. I don't agree with him. I'm not going to condemn that person or anything else. But I'm willing to be used as a vessel for the sake of that person who does those things. Why? Because I've been there before. I've been the recipient of a lot of stuff. But have you accidentally hurt somebody's feelings? Anybody ever do that? Have you accidentally hurt somebody's feelings and you have no idea what you did? And then you found out it was genuine and you said, oh no, I, I, no, I can't do this anymore. Right? You ever done that? Now in that case, if you accidentally hurt somebody's feelings, would you want that person to shun you for the rest of your life? I bet you wouldn't. So why would I shun somebody who does some something dark like that, knowing that Satan has them and they're not really aware of it all? I'll tell you this, so if any evil person in the world knew what hell was, they would not be evil. If anybody truly knew what Satan was, they would never worship him. If they truly knew they were being separated from all light, they would never agree with darkness. See, I know that. Get all these folks out here so ready to give up. How many of us have been those people from time to time? We just didn't tell anybody. Huh? How many of us have been that same person at some point in time? We just didn't let anybody know. My advice, never agree with Satan. Never agree to the condemnation of another person. Because that's exactly what Satan wants. That's how he gains real estate. Lazarus. He knew what it was to be a recipient of evil. What he gained in life was the truth of evil itself. He saw the truth. Now listen to me. This is what I want to bring out. If you guys saw the truth, would you... If you saw the absolute truth, you think you'd still be the same? Do you think you'd be the same? If you saw the truth, would you still be the same? I explain this one little thing. Lazarus saw the truth of what this world truly is. Lazarus saw the truth. He did. He didn't gain too much, not by this parable. He saw the truth of it. Now this is a parable, but he still saw the truth. When you're in that unfortunate position, and everything is dark in your life, and people begin to turn away, and you have that loss of love and everything else, whether you cause that or not, and you're stuck in that position, all too often you can see the truth of this world. The side of the world nobody wants to see. Some of you, when you get in these places, you do everything you can because you don't want to see that side of the world. Your Father in Heaven is a God of truth, is He not? I'm giving you an answer to something. Your Father in Heaven is a God of truth, correct? He's a God of truth. Listen, if you are to see the truth of your choices, because one thing you're doing is choosing between darkness and light. You're choosing between good and evil. And in order to see the truth, I mean, you really see the truth? Guess what? You're going to have to be exposed to it. Lazarus was exposed to the truth.
truth of darkness. If you, if you were an alcoholic, you've been exposed to the truth of a type darkness that goes with alcohol. Almost certainly the end result for quite a few people. It's a fact. You've been exposed to the truth. See, some people can get away with a drink or two every so often, but you saw the truth. You saw the truth. Why it's commercialized and everything. You saw the truth of it. And when you realized you were stuck, you probably said, Father, I don't want this. I don't want this. God will show you the truth of a thing. Those who have been addicted, you know the truth behind it. Do you know how many people don't know the truth? They don't know the truth behind it. They don't know, but you know the darkness behind so many things. You've seen the truth. And when you saw that truth, you know what you said? I don't want it. If you're addicted right now, you don't want the addiction. You know what that addiction is. But you saw the truth. Do you not know all throughout your life? God has been showing you the truth. How many of you have seen so many unfortunate endings? How many? You've seen the truth of the unfortunate ending of too many things in your own personal life. How many have seen that? And sometimes it feels like you can't quite climb out. How many feel like something is attached to them? They, because they keep experiencing these negative things. And then I'm sure you, your father will show you the truth of darkness and light. But here it is. Did you hear what Abraham said? Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy goods. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Do you understand what's happening? Do you see, you still have to see the truth. This to be immersed in it. The truth is to know it, not to have read about it, but to know it. And the only way to know it is to walk into it. You have seen the darkness. You've seen the negativity. You've seen the heartbreak. You've seen all that because you walked right into it. You don't even know how you got yourself in all those situations. Notice I did not say the devil did it. Now that you've walked through that, all those situations, what happened when you found out that little harmless thing was evil what happened when you found out that little tiny pill that really relieved your pain could be so evil there could be so much evil behind it you wanted to warn somebody didn't you hey don't 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 don't, don't if you don't have to don't do it because you didn't choose it so all this stuff you've been exposed to the darkness in this world which is what most of you have seen the point is you've seen it but you serve a God of truth and you are the child of a God of truth. Listen to me, I'm not giving you a pep talk, I'm telling you something. You have seen much of the unfortunate things, but now you have to see the light of things. Do you hear me? Your God is a God of truth. Lazarus saw the darkness and what happened to him, he was in a place of absolute comfort. This other guy who lived sumptuously clothed in purple and fine linen he saw all the good of life so now he has to see what 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 does he have to see there you got it you got it now measure up how many dark things you found yourself at the end of listen i know a lot of you did it yourself sin is not accidental we chose it but why did the lord ever allow us to choose it like that in the first place why not just stop us? Why not just stop us from ever going down that path? Because you had to know what it truly was. You have to know what those destructive forces are. Your God can halt anything in your life. Christ can speak peace to any situation. But he didn't. Why? Because you had to see the truth of it. You had to feel it. Some of you had to be addicted. Had to know that that thing is deadly. Some of you have scar. You have much scars. All of us have some kind of wounds and scars, scrapes, and this. But you've seen the darkness. That's why you never discard it. Don't ever discard it. Because every time you see or come to an ending like that, what do you end up saying? You say no to the darkness, don't you? Isn't that your end result? You'll say no to it. I'm telling you something. This is a beautiful parable for identification purposes. It is. Many of the purposes. This one identification. Your father is a God of truth. He sets before you darkness and light, life or death. 
And he says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. So what do you think your life is every single day? If he said, choose ye this day whom you will serve, why didn't he say, choose for your life who you will serve? Nope. He said, choose this day. What does that mean? Every day of your life is part of the process, and you're going to have to make a choice. In order to make that choice, you have to really see what darkness is and what light is. Now, some of us, we have an actual identification system of what darkness is in some cases. But those things, we don't really know what it is. We have to walk in it. And so I'm telling you something. When your life is upended, when trials and tribulations come, you can truly rejoice. I didn't mean have a party in it, but have an understanding that your father is showing you the truth of things, not a lie. It is a lie when your life is hunky-dory every single day. Imagine if all a person saw was good things. Good things every day they were on earth. Let me tell you something. When the adversary raises his heads, they're going to have no strength. They've never gone up before darkness before. They cannot stand. All of you who have been through things, you are here for those people. You're not here to gloat. There are going to be folks coming to you who have never gone through too much. They're not going to know what to do when their requests fail. You know when it says the love of many is going to wax colder and colder because iniquity abounds, and it also says that people are going to fall away. That means they won't believe anymore. Why will they fall away? This is before that man of perdition is revealed. Many will fall away, but why? I'll tell you why. Because the Bible gives us an answer. And I've never read this before, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you because we're going to read it anyway. It's because God's people are going to start saying to themselves, God has forgotten about us. God's people will start to say, the Lord has forgotten about us. And why will God's people say that? Because of what happens to the world. I know a couple of people, their houses have been demolished three years in a row by storms. These are Christians. They have a big question mark over their faith because they say, I don't understand. We do everything right. This is what they say. We do everything right. What everything they say we do right. The same situation is starting to happen to quite a few people. They don't understand how they can conform to so much and then something like that happen. They can't see it. They can't see it. Let me tell you something. If you say, hear me on this, if, I, if a storm knocked down my place three years in a row, I'm not going to get attached to anything of materialism in this world another day. I'm going to say, Lord, well, that does that. I will appreciate what you give me for this day, but my heart will never be in it. See, the Lord said, don't store your treasure up on earth where moth and rust and everything can get to it. So what's the problem? Many hearts are tied up and stuck in this world. And when it's lost, they think that somehow they're being punished. That's not the truth. The Lord is delivering us. See, some people's hearts are stuck in materialism. And if they lost everything, they would say, well, the Lord has forgotten about me. That's not true. Oh, you're so much more than a, that house. You see the problem. You see how people's identity is not within themselves in their relationship with Christ. It's with themselves and all the material things they have with them. Do you see that? If they lost everything, they would surely say, God does not love me anymore. That, that, you, that materialism has nothing to do with God's love. Do you all see that? Please tell me, somebody tell me that you can see that. You know when Jesus said those in Judea, flee, run, don't go back to take anything out of your houses. I wonder how many people are not going to be able to do that. Well, according to the Bible, quite a few are not going to be able to do that. They won't be able to separate from their goods. It won't be. Can you guys see that? Some of you have not been able to secure property and things like that. Let, let me share this with you. Your father knows your heart. Thank you, Lord. Listen, let me tell you why. You're looking, you have a heart, first of all, that you would pad any place you're in. You have a beautiful heart. You'd make a beautiful place and people would enjoy it. But your heart would be involved in it. With you, everything you do, your heart's involved in. Your father could not have you to invest your heart in stuff. So he can't allow you 
to have that it would destroy you. Not that you would be openly rebellious, no. It's because you're so full of compassion and everything you would pour yourself into would then be a part of your heart. And all these things around you with your heart involved would empower you to do more for people, yes. But the problem would be your heart would be fractured and to lose all that would stop you in your tracks. The same one I'm talking to or those I'm talking to. You've lost things before and when you lost things a different feeling came inside you like a piece of you died. That's why you cannot have it. Not here. Because that would weaken your faith too much. Be content. Be thankful. Trust the Lord's path for you. There are too many lost. When they lose material things, they think their life is over, their identity is over. That's not the truth. And for those of you that have, meditate upon that. Make sure that your heart is never connected to this materialistic things. And the best way to do that is this. Of all the stuff around you, decree that nothing is yours. Commend all things for usage of the kingdom. And if someone asks of you, be prepared to give it to them. If you can do that, then your heart is not attached. If you can't, you're going to have to break some things because the time is coming. And those who are tied to materialism are not going to make it. In my case, personally, I can give you this. Everything I have, I have committed for usage of the kingdom of God. It's not mine. It's for the kingdom. That's what it's for. So that if everything were to vanish right now, it would not even make me skip a beat. It wouldn't. It certainly would not mess with my enthusiasm with the Lord, my relationship with the Lord anything. I may not be able to talk for a little bit, or I may not be able to do a few things for a little bit, but my relationship with the Lord would be as strong as iron. Why is that? See, I've been broken in materialism the first time, and the second time, and there was a third time. I told you guys that story. I gave away everything I had when I was swapping duty stations. One day, one day, it clicked. I had about, oh my goodness, I had, I had, I had it. I had it, and I gave every single thing away. The only thing I kept were uniforms. No civilian clothing, no electronics, no anything. Five days after I did that, I said, why did I do that? That was the first time it happened. And then I came to myself again, and I said, oh, I can't do that. But I'm telling you, I went through something. You think it was easy the first time you have lost your mind. It was not easy. I even went through some emotions. Because I remember sitting down one time and I was thinking about a movie, right? Just, just stop it. And, and I gave away every single VHS and beta tape I had. Everything. And it, then I remembered giving it all away. And I said, why did I not stop myself? Then over a few years, it happened again. And I did it again. And that was including two sobs. The black and the red one, I gave those away to Tyler and all. Gave everything away again. But this time, I said, uh -uh. nothing is going to tie me to anything in this world like that. What I noticed the second time was it was competing. It's what was happening. That materialistic stuff was competing with my relationship with Christ. See, because if I ever have to scoot the word of God away for something else, oh, that's competition. I'll not have that. So it has to go. So there are certain things I'll never fall into. I will not permit nor allow that to happen. I'm telling you now, it's not easy to part that way. Materialism is a big deal. According to the word of God, it's going to take down many. So you might want to prepare for that. It's not easy. But what it does is it uncovers that most of your identity can be within your stuff. And right now, some of you have stuff and it may define you. Your guests come in, you're proud that your guests come in because of your stuff. Because you have something to show them, or this and the other. But be careful, your stuff does not define you. When you can give something away with no reservations or anything, you're there, you're there. Somebody asked me that I get a lot of people. Ask, I have no pictures anywhere on my. And I don't keep pictures. I don't do the picture thing. Do you guys know that? I don't do that. I don't do the picture thing because it ins, it, it it encourages me. 
myself to do something. Now, if you're built up in this area, there's no issue for you, right? I'm just telling you right now, when it comes to materialistic things, I like a specific environment. I'm very meticulous about that, right? I am. I am. Believe me, I am. I like everything you dress right dress. So I'm very meticulous in those things. That's why I won't do it either. I can't have that either. I'll not have that. I give away things in a heartbeat. I don't give the worst thing. I give the best thing. Because I can't have anything competing with the word of that's something That's my responsibility. That's not something the Lord is going to force of me. That's something we do or don't do. But I can tell you something. The whole world is changing. And those of you who had all this negativity in the world. Now, true enough, some of the stuff is because of us. But there are those cases where everything should have worked out, but it didn't. There are those cases where you don't sow seeds of evil to somebody else. You often reap them. There are certain things you don't sow that you can reap. And it's part of you being raised. You've experienced the truth of this darkness. Thank God that every time you do, you choose righteousness. Your day is coming. For those of you who, who have not gone, you have a pretty balanced life. Be very thankful. Do me a favor, make sure that you're not attached to materialistic things. That's so e easily overlooked. And it's going to become a problem. It'll become a problem during these days. It really is. You guys are going to hear me say this more and more as a certain time draws closer. But a series of things will happen in this world. And if you're not careful, you for example, there are going to be a lot of rich people in this world. It'd be so easy if the devil showed up and everybody went broke. Well, that's easy. That's easy right there, isn't it? That's easy right there. That's, but that's not the way that's going to be. This is my belief. I believe a time of richness is coming. And when I say richness, I mean a time of prosperity that none of you can imagine. A time of real global relief is coming. Do you know how many people are going to be so thankful when that time gets here? But that's going to be the big challenge. Many will get used to the relief and like the lifestyle and say, wow, this is awesome. And I know in my heart of hearts, they're not going to be able to give it up. See, it's like once you've been, have you guys ever had your electricity turned off in a storm or something like that? Right? You have your electricity turned off. And after four, five, six, seven days, it gets rough. Sometimes two weeks, but when the when the power is restored, and say it was a storm and the, the power's out, when the power's restored, it's like a small celebration you have. Now, nobody can tell me they don't have a little celebration. Don't tell me that, that you don't have a little celebration. There's some woo-hoos and some there, whatever it is, right? When they come back on, when the lights are restored, I'm telling you what, it's like a new lease on life. See, you guys know. In that moment, if somebody were to call you on the phone, phone and say, Hey, listen, I know your lights were just restored, but I'm doing this test. And I'd like to get at least 20 or 30 people to turn their lights off for two weeks. And we'll just come by and take the, you know, the main fuse out of your breaker box to make sure it's off. Would you be willing to participate? You would say, Oh, no, I just got my lights back and I can't, I can't do this. Goodbye. That's what you would say. You would not be in a rush. To join any group that's doing that test. Right? In other words, you wouldn't be willing to give up your lights. Just like you just got them back on. You wouldn't want them back off again. Because when your lights go off, you realize how much junk you have in your house. You know, the stuff that doesn't work. The stuff that's in the way. And then you start to imagine, well, if the lights never turn back on, this will be no good for anything. This will be no good for anything. That will be no good for anything. This is in the way. I could set that on fire. Right? That's what you start thinking. When the lights are restored, it's almost like you never had that conversation. You're not thinking about it anymore. I mean, it's totally... Have you ever said, I got to get prepared just in case we lose power? That's when your power is out. You're like, you know. And when the lights turn, you know, when they get everything restored, I'm going to make sure I have this for next time. Next time comes, you never have it. You're like everybody else. Oh, I think I need batteries. Let me go check that flashlight. I don't know where I put the flashlight. You know, things like that would happen. Because when it comes to conveniences, the truth is we're not willing. We're not willing to go without them. Especially 
electricity, of which so many things depend upon, of which your lifestyle depends upon. Now we have cell phones. They don't even, you know, truth be told, they don't need electricity to get you. We're not willing to give up our communications, are we? The number one thing people are concerned about. Well, if we have an EMP, how are we going to talk to each other? They forgot about eating. They forgot about eating. They forgot about water. They forgot about all that. And they said, hey, how are we going to talk to each other? Well, the phones work. That was the number one question. If, if there was an EMP, everybody wants to know. Well, their phones work. They didn't ask about eating. They didn't ask about water. They wanted to know where their phones were. You remember everybody came out with these devices to wrap your phone in in case we have an EMP? Right? Put your phone in this so it'll work. If we have an EMP, you better know they're going to have a high altitude EMP, no satellite surf. What do you need your cell phone for? Today, the cell phones work in a different way than they did back in the past. You have processing power on that phone. But when it comes to core data, the data expires in your phone. Most of the core data is sitting somewhere else. And if it doesn't work, your cell phone's not going to do you any good. And people are going to walk around with their cell phones working with no food, no water, no anything, no communications. Well, my cell phone works. Maybe they'll get one of those satellites up there repaired or something. That's why everybody was worried about an EMP. Their priorities are crooked or something. Electricity is not going out. It's not going out. <laughs> It, it, it's not good. We'll, we'll have storms and challenges. But for the whole thing to go out and that's just the way it is? No. You know what the real issue is going to be? Who's going to sell their soul out to keep their good stuff? How much of your soul are you willing to give up to keep your new life status? That's going to be the question. You know, I was looking the other day. At the beginning of this year, of course, millionaires are made all the time. Do you guys know the last... Four to five weeks, thousands of millionaires have been made from crypto. People who had absolutely nothing are now millionaires from crypto. Isn't that something? Billionaires. How much of your soul are you willing to compromise to keep your status? And because people who don't give up something of themselves, I'm not going to tell you what that is. They're going to have to be on the outskirts of everything else. They're not going to have it so easy. Those who fully comply with the new, I'm, I'm going to call them an instruction set, they're going to be out having barbecues and everything else. They're going to have holidays like you never saw them before. They're going to beautify things like you've never seen. And those who say no, they're going to be in the outskirts. No lights, no anything, and even that will be different. In fact, if, if God didn't stand for those who would say no to the mark of the beast, uh, they'd certainly be kaput. One of the processes is being implemented now for the end. So something different is coming. Something that people can't really see. A prosperous time. A reordering can happen in the snap of a finger. Most people think it's going to take a long time. No, no, everything is set up right now. People are going to face a real Christian. But let me tell you this. Everybody who chooses comfort over their faith... The reason they chose the comfort is because their faith was never solidified. And what I mean by that, they weren't tried in life. They weren't tried. Do you know certain people are terrified to suffer? Like many of you are terrified to suffer. You are. You're terrified to suffer. That's what bothers many of you about the end times. You don't know if you're going to suffer or not. See, a lot of people say, well, Lord, you know I don't want to suffer, so i got to be raptured before anything happens. That's what they say. They're terrified of suffering. They say, well, surely the Lord won't have us go through things like that. And then you have other people on the Internet. You know, it's from Internet University. They're out there. They will tell you that everybody's going through everything. That's what they tell you. What they have forgotten on both sides is this. Life is real. What you're doing right now is for real. And it's happening right now today. It's not waiting for another time. And you're going through things today. You're having moral choices today, not the future. Some of the anguish and people dying by starvation, that's happening right now today. That's happening today. Large groups of people dying. That's happening today, right now. It's happening right now. The choice is today. The dark one. Whoosh.
surely being made public to everybody. His influence is here today. But what did your father tell you? One, he would never leave you nor forsake you. Two, you would have the victory. He did, didn't he? He did. He told you that. That you would be delivered. You would have the victory. The Lord knows how to deliver the righteous. You have faith, not because of yourself, but because of him. God gave you that faith. And you would go to his son. And that his son would keep you, not lose you. Be authentic. Don't look for your paradise to be here on this earth. Haven't you noticed that anybody who presents you a paradise here on this earth? Something is always attached to it. He knows we live in this society. Listen, he already knows you live here. He already knows you need certain things to eat and to drink. He has already prayed for a blessing over you. He already did that. He already secured you wherever you are. He did. If that were the case, you'd be gone already. He has supplied all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So you'll never go without. You don't read about starvation in the end days in the Bible concerning God's people, do you? What you hear about are those in Israel, specifically in Jerusalem, who are under a captivity situation. That's what you read about. Now what you're going to have to do is make moral decisions. You're going to have to let nothing compete with your faith. To have it grounded, surely. See, most people are worried about... It's part fantasy. Your real adversary, he cannot touch you. But he can influence you. He can make you corrupt yourselves. He can feed you ideas of darkness. And if you act on them, you will tear down your brothers and your sisters. You're to be watchful of that enemy that would ever make you blame somebody else or point at somebody else or condemn somebody else. See, while everybody's looking for this physical destruction to come, many are being destroyed spiritually right now. Just how many people, not more than two months ago, were condemning too many folks? Think about it. That's what Satan wants you to do. To condemn somebody. Because your Lord said, if you condemn, you're already condemned. To condemn someone is not to forgive them. To not for forgive them is to not be forgiven. And if you're not forgiven, you are to reap everything you sowed. That means when your life goes down the tubes, it's going to go quick, fast and furious and painful at the same time. When you repent, or does not remember your sin anymore. It truly will break from darkness and things of iniquity. Your father separates you from anything concerning that sin. That's when you repent. Satan doesn't want you to repent. Somebody says, Michael, where are people in the U.S. starving? Everywhere. It's not one location. It's everywhere. Was, have you guys seen what's happening? I'm not even going to get on this. Because this is a big deal to me. You don't see homeless shelters all over the place anymore, do you? Who thought up? What people thought up to get rid of the homeless shelters? If you look in certain places, you'll find them. And they're hungry. The scraps are not easily found like they used to. Right? When they took down the homeless shelters, the kitchens disappeared. The kitchens disappeared. And if you look into these cities and their councils, they'll say, well, we're trying to discourage homelessness by not putting up these shelters. But if you ask them, what have you done with the homeless already? Well, they can get help. All they have to do is, you know, call. So how are they going to call with no phone? The churches, many of them are overwhelmed. The good churches are overwhelmed. And they, can, they can't even get the help they used to. Kids with swollen stomachs going to school, I've, they're out there. They're making an appearance like this stuff is not happening. It's happening. It's a coldness in this country that I have never felt before. And that coldness is growing. And it will translate into some of the hottest fires this nation has ever seen. Many things are covered up. It is disgusting. But they're all over the place. If you ever want to know the heart of the place you live in, then find the poor. They will let you know what the place you live in actually is. By the way, Luke chapter 16, I'm going to call that the principle of Babylon. Did you guys take notice of something in Luke chapter 16? Why choose the name Lazarus? Why Lazarus? 
We know that Lazarus is the one that was dead. He was the human being that was dead, was brought back to life. We know that was the friend of Christ, the close one of Christ. But the point was, he was brought back from the dead by the Messiah. That's the point. Who is this other guy? There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. That's a description of Babylon. Babylon, purple, and in fine linen. A Christian, a human being that dies and is raised specifically by the Messiah. Not we the ones who died to sell. And Babylon, you never heard about Babylon's suffering in the Bible. All you hear about is Babylon's dominion. The appointment in the book of Daniel about Babylon having rule over the whole earth. How King Nebuchadnezzar was that head of gold, the standard, and all other kingdoms which come from him would be inferior. But those kingdoms would have dominion over all the earth. How that the last would be diverse from all the rest. Isn't there something? The affliction of Lazarus. He didn't get the good food. He got the crumbs from the rich man. Boy, does that sound familiar? He got the crumbs. He was sick. He had sores. He was at the gates of the rich man. He can never come fully in and dine with the rich man. He was always looking from the outside in. Sounds just like many of you. You're not on the inside, are you? You know, in the word of God, when it says, Come out of her, my people, be not partakers of her sins, that you won't partake of her plagues. Be thankful here on the outside. Why is it that we share the same characteristics as this? Why is this, this parable, the rich man and Lazarus, given by Christ, why is it so consistent? It's a good reference. It's also part of a theme of the Word of God that stays consistent from beginning to end. Hear me on this, because some of you, listen, before you guys say, there he goes again saying that rich is bad noise, no, some people, you're appointed. Whatever you have, riches, does not make you a sinner. No. No, willingness of heart makes a person a sinner or not. Not the riches. Riches are nothing. It's nothing but a tool. I'll share some, something with you and give you a caution. For those of you with money, haven't you ever noticed that regardless of the money you have, if you solve one problem, See, you solve a materialistic problem. Then you're going to have some other sort of issue pop up in your life. Has anybody noticed, like you're assigned a specific type of condition you must have in your life, that when you get rid of it one way, it comes back a different way? For a person who has bill problems, you get all those bills paid away, you may have relationship issues. You get that squared away, you may have health issues. You get that squared away, you're going to have another issue. There's always some sort of issue you're going to go through. Why? The principle of Babylon. Don't worry. We're going to expand on this in a big way. And by the end of it, you will know precisely what I'm talking about. No matter what you escape, this Lazarus thing is going to be true for a lot. Why though? Why? Why would that? Why can't we just have a good time right here? Because of the principle of Christ. Because you're not here to make this place your paradise. And I'll say it again. If you're growing up in this world and you truly believe it's what the world says it is, that's, what's, that's when you're going to get upset. This world, you're here to go through a process. This is the womb. This is a womb, not paradise. This place is full of testing. This place assists in raising you so that you can be born. Born into the eternal realm. This place is where you stay outside the gates. The next place is where the gates belong to you. This is the place, the crucible, where you choose darkness and light for real. If you never had this process, any one of us could say, I'll serve the Lord forever. And we would be, we would, who could prove us wrong? 
even an evil, an evil spirit at the beginning could have said, I love the Lord. If you could prosecute evil at the beginning, it would say, you can't prosecute me. I didn't do anything wrong. Why would, you know, Hitler when he was a baby, I, I guarantee you could talk to little baby Hitler and say, you know, you're, you're going to be terrible. He would say, no, I'm not. And he may cry and hurt his feelings. But as he grows, he becomes what he truly is. If you look at evil at its beginning, it's not evil. But guess what? There's a process called earth. It's called life. You come to this process, and what you truly are is going to be bought out of you. You're exposed to everything you're put in various conditions. You're choosing light and darkness. At the end of the matter, the sum total of you will be the choices you have made. And those choices, I'm not talking about the earthbound choices. No, the real choices. Right? Like what you agree with, darkness or light. You see the truth of a matter, do you still like that dark thing? Most, if not all of us, will say no. This is a process. Jesus gave us a hint. He kept telling us to pray always. Why would he say pray always if this were not a process? God could at any time redo the whole thing. Have you exist in the eternal realm without none of this happening? But he didn't. Why? He put you in this crucible and you're doing everything by way of truth. Do you know that? I'm not talking about you being tricked into sin, no. When you find out what darkness is, do you embrace it or reject it? If you're a Christian, if you're a true believer in Christ, you'll reject it and you truthfully know what darkness is. How can a person ever get themselves in that dark position because they don't truly know what darkness is? If a person knows what darkness truly is, they will never choose it. Not when they belong to the living God. Which is why you all had to go through everything. Which is why I had to go through everything. If somebody talked about being an alcoholic, you would say, Oh, I don't want, I'm not going to be that. But when you've lived the life and became an alcoholic, you can warn others and say, No, that's no good. What are you doing when you do that? You're telling people the truth about it. And if you're full of anguish because you're still stuck on it, you're not choosing it. See, that's when Paul said, it is no longer I that sin, but my flesh. In other words, you may have a physical necessity of that alcohol in the body. That's called an addiction. But you yourselves hate what you're doing. See, when you hate the sin you're in, given another chance, you'll never touch it, no matter what. Do you know that? No one will be able to, t if a person had an addiction all their life, and I mean, they struggled with it, and they hated it, and then they died. All of a sudden, they, they find out they don't die. They just transfer to another realm. Let me tell you something. Nothing that could ever exist will ever get them that way again. Nothing. And I'll tell you something. You're struggling with something in this world, and you're doing your best to overcome it. Deliverance comes with a Messiah. But when you pass from this place into the next, you're not going to be like Satan was. He fell from his own thoughts of grandeur. That won't happen to you. Some of you have been tried to suck a degree. There's no falling in you at all. When you struggle with something in this world, when you're trying to overcome something in this world, if you were given the opportunity to be set free from it, if the Lord delivers you at the right time, you'll never go back to it. I'll say it again. If the Lord told us about darkness, we would say, okay, so that's no good. But it's the same reason a child often has to touch something hot before they truly leave it alone. You can tell a kid all day that's hot, that will burn and hurt you. Okay. Little Billy goes off doing things and he comes back and he's looking at it. Oh, don't you touch, that'll burn you. Okay. One day, he puts his little finger up and, pss, and he cries his heart out. From that day forward, he knows it's going to burn and guess what? You never have to tell him again that's going to burn him. He already knows. If he looks at that stove, he's going to look at it and with a big caution in him and saying, I hope nobody else sticks their fingers up there. That thing will hurt you. See, then he knows it. Well, we do the same thing. We're going through life. People can tell us what darkness is. Jesus can tell us what things are wrong. The Lord can tell us what things are wrong all day. It grabs a hold of us and it shakes just about all the life out of us. If we ever get free, We'll go and tell the world, do not ever do that. You're becoming a witness of what the truth actually is. And we serve a God of truth who does not present phonyism to 
his children. He's putting before us real life and real death. He's putting before us real light and real darkness. We serve a God of truth. And your choice is based on the truth. It's not based on what you say. No, no. You're living out your truth. You're living it right now. We can say all we want. I'm telling you, you're living out your truth right now. There are things that we have done in life. How many people sit have sat by themselves and they said, how can the, how can the Lord ever love me? You're ashamed of something you did in the past or whatever the case is, and it hurts you to your heart. Then you have a thought or somebody calls or they tell you, Wait, what are you doing? I don't see how the Lord can love me. And they talk to you and then you tell them I did something so shameful. No living anything should ever forgive me. And that's when they tell you, ah, but the perfect one came and died just for that. His sacrifice covers all of that. He, through his sacrifice, made you free from that. You are free indeed. A person discovers first the truth of their own sin, and it is truly sin to them. I mean, hurtful to them. No matter what the level or the depth of it is, when a person realizes they have truly sinned and that their activities by no means reflected upon the goodness of the Father and they feel ashamed that they're still alive, that they even have life, and thought of the Messiah is the most life giving thought anybody could ever have to know that he took it all away that is a perpetual thanks that never dies when we realize that we sinned that's when we have no more heart for that sin do you guys understand that that's when we do not want anything of that sin we do not hunger for it we will not ever do it again that's when we have repented it has to stain first. See, because all too often people have said they were sorry and did the same thing again. That's not repentance. Repentance is when you have no heart for it anymore. Usually that happens when the sin hurts. Then when you think about the Messiah, you are indeed free. When you accept that upon your life, his sacrifice, there is no one worthy of any greater honor and thanks then the Messiah and then you see it then you see it you've been placed in this process God already knew what you would do you didn't know what you would do God knew what evil would do it did not know what it would do and he puts it here and what has evil done evil has done nothing but attempt to destroy the righteous that's what evil does. That's why it's evil. For how it pursues the righteous, it cannot help itself. This likewise, faith is actually exhibited by the walk of a saint who's been tried by darkness. Because when you see that darkness, you want nothing to do with it. When you become a part of it, that's when the shame comes in because you know you're not of it. One thought of the Messiah, and that's when things comes in. Because you know you're bought with a price. The price of the life of the only begotten. That's the highest price anybody could ever pay. And when all that sinks in, that's called strength. That's called an undying hope. It's the power of the blood of the Lamb. Full forgiveness. Absolute. Repentance is key. But repentance never comes with denial. But you have no more heart for it, you truly are born again. A born again Christian has no heart for the darkness of the old man. But he hungers and thirsts for righteousness. His food becomes the righteousness of Christ, the goodness of the Lord, the word of God, and many things that person will see. This world is not a paradise. For those who believe it's a paradise, those are the ones upset. And they've never gotten what they wanted, have they? And when they try to establish it, it's always ended in carnage, hasn't it? Every single time. Because this is not a paradise. This is a process. This is the womb. 
in the womb as having birth pains, contractions, as time is slows. Now that we've gone over some basics at Babylon, the sting of that place won't be so hard when we talk about the reality of Babylon. Because I'll pose something to you. What if Babylon is, was never a place? What if Babylon... And, and, and again... I give you this one small mystery at the end of the book of Revelation. Why is Gog Magog the whole earth? Why is it? Same thing is happening with Babylon. And Babylon will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. It will not be pardoned. It won't. But God's people were found in it, which is why he said, Come out of her, my people. What was these people doing in it in the first place? That should let you know where you are, what this place is. The condition of a place becomes one of those ancient names like Babylon. The title and the prophecy against Gog Magog is fulfilled at the end of the Bible. That is fulfillment. Though the wars continue. As we expand it, you'll need a notebook next time. I didn't mean to do it, but I kind of wrote some notes on this next one for, for our type of um, illustration of how biblically things fit together. I found this interesting in Luke, and I found 17 more chapters, right? Not in Luke, but all throughout the Word of God, that describe this same exact scenario. The place, purple and fine linen, describing some individual as being rich, and then the wounded outside the gates begging for scraps. I found that same theme over and over and over and over. And did you see the end of the matter in Luke? This is a parable. This is not specifically about Babylon. This is a parable. But in this parable is the wisdom of the Lord. And the wisdom of the Lord is consistent from beginning to end. It is the wisdom of the Almighty. The same thing with Babylon. That's in this parable. And the saints, oddly enough, that's in this parable. I wanted to bring this one out just to show you because the other ones do this exact same thing. God will always. He, he you know, it says God changes not, right? He is, a big, he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He changes not, right? And when he said in the Bible, I'm going to do a new thing, you remember that? Remember that? That was with, that, he was regarding Christ when you read that whole thing. The new thing he would do, what he never did before, right? Were the declarations that were due at that time leading into the New Testament. We are the readers of all those acts and God changes not. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We can know he's very consistent. Everything he does is the same way. It is trustworthy. See, when you can know someone, Especially when you know their doings all throughout history. They can really become trustworthy. And you can really find comfort in that type of trustworthiness. Knowing that God has a standard. Even in the parables of, parables of Christ, that standard still exists. Right? So even his parables have wisdom. And by the way, he said parables. Because it was not for those who were not appointed the kingdom of God to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And that is reserved for those who are of the kingdom. That means it's reserved for you. So these parables describe something that is not meant for everybody to comprehend. It's so that hearing, they won't hear. Right? Now I got that from the Lord. So the Lord spoke parables so that those who were not spiritual, those who had no inheritance with the kingdom of God, would not hear it. Though they would hear the parable, they would not hear the message in the parable. That's why parables are given. How do we know that? Because that's what Jesus taught. That's exactly what he said. So that hearing they may not hear, seeing they may not see. Because it's only given to his children to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And he also said, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But it is not meant for those who have no inheritance. It's not meant for them. So all they see is the parable. For you, something else is meant for you're meant to see something else. And it comes out from time to time spiritually. When you consider it. You know what I believe? I believe that we are Babylon. And her hour is coming quickly. And that hour opens up. And it will. It will alter everything. And in those days, all of you with faith are going to have to dig in deep. 
but don't become fearful. This is part for you. It's a process. Never forget that. For you, it's a process. It is necessary for your deliverance. It is part of your father's goodness. But to the world, it is his vengeance. Remember that. His vengeance is not for you. His wrath is not for you. His love is directed towards you. And it will never turn back on him. He commanded his love towards us. That means it won't fail. So if you have faith and you believe in Christ Jesus and have accepted him, you truly are one of his. You truly are. And he will finish the work he began in you. I already know he's not going to finish the work I began in myself. He'll finish the work he began in me. It's very important that I make that distinction. You know what that means? You're going to be okay. He's going to bring you all the way through. Learning about this process, I believe is important. Learning that this is a process is important. Because people have tried to convince folks of what life was, but that was based off worldly wisdom. And it will never work out their way for you. It's going to work out for you the way the Father deemed it to work out. When you are secured, the flood will come, the deluge, but not of water. But once you're secured, the deluge will come. COT is base of operations is right here at the Council of Time .com. COT has no other outlet or venue. These are other folks who will rebroadcast. Anything COT does is by the main page here at the Council of Time .com. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.